Welcome back to Hardware Legends. This is episode 4 and today we're discussing the NVIDIA TI graphics cards. And yes, I pronounce it TI. Everybody I've ever met pronounces it TI, not TI, so we're going to go with TI. So let's get into it. The TI is short for titanium. There isn't any particular reason why Nvidia decided on this, although titanium is a precious metal, so it did give them plenty to work with from a marketing perspective. Mainly though, they started the TI cards because they would often try to insert these cards between two existing graphics card models. For example, the GTX 1070 and GTX 1080 had been out for over a year before Nvidia decided to release a new GPU that would be in between both of them in terms of price and performance. Now they could have called it the GTX 1075, but instead they opted for the GTX 1070 Ti, presenting it as a better version of another card customers are already familiar with rather than an entirely new GPU. This is smart from Nvidia, but it isn't always the case that the TI cards are just GPUs that have been inserted between two existing models. TI cards have been available from launch in certain generations and are sometimes in completely their own class, sharing very little with the little brother that they share a name with, such as the GTX 1080 Ti, which is closer to a Titan X Pascal than a GTX 1080. With that in mind, let's go over all the TI cards that have ever been made by NVIDIA. The first NVIDIA TI graphics card was the GeForce 2 TI way back in October of 2001. This was followed up by the GeForce TI 200 for the mid-range and the TI 500 for the high-end. From the GeForce 3 series. And then finally for the old TI era, there was the TI 4200, 4400, 4600, 4800 and 4800 SE in 2002, which were quite the upgrade over the previous generation. After the GeForce 4 series, Nvidia dropped the TI branding for 8 years until resurrecting it with the GeForce 500 series. These are the first TI cards I personally used and this video will focus on the modern era of TI cards from the 500 series and up. So let's get into it. The first modern Nvidia Titanium or TI cards were released with the 500 series GPUs which featured refreshed Fermi GPUs from the wildly popular NVIDIA GTX 400 series, which featured the legendary GTX 480, which combined insane performance with insane power and temperature production. Where does that sound familiar? The 500 series were significantly modified versions of the 400 series Fermi GPUs, produced using the 40 nanometer fabrication process and saw the introductions of the GTX 560 Ti and the GTX 550 Ti. I actually briefly owned a GTX 560 Ti, but it kept making my monitor go black, so I returned it and got a GTX 570 instead. The 550 Ti is a bit of a confusing one, as there was never a GTX 550, however, there was a GTX 555, which was released two months after the 550 Ti. But that GPU was more powerful and was closer to a GTX 560 since it featured the same GF114 GPU compared to the GF116 in the 550 Ti. So it was a quite a confusing graphics card, but it did compete well with the AMD 5770, which was its main rival. The 560 Ti was also released before the GTX 560. The 560 Ti featured 384 CUDA cores compared to the 336 of the 560, but less than the 480 CUDA cores of the more powerful 
GTX 570, which was also a very popular card back then, but the 560 Ti was still a great value GPU, which was about 30% faster than the previous generation GTX 460, and slotted itself nicely between the Radeon HD 6870 and 6950. Nvidia also did release a 448 CUDA core version of the 560 Ti almost a year after the original 560 Ti released, but far fewer people own this GPU, so there really isn't much point going into it. Moving on to the 600 series, Nvidia introduced the new Kepler architecture many of you may have heard of. These 28 nanometer Kepler GPUs were aimed at achieving an increase in performance compared to the previous generation, but also increasing the performance per watt, achieving this through the use of a unified clock. Large gains were made to the GDDR5 memory speeds as Nvidia introduced a new memory controller and bus, which resulted in memory speeds being raised to 6000 MHz compared to the 4000 MHz of the previous generation. The 600 series were also the first NVIDIA GPUs to feature GPU boost, which is similar to how CPU turbo clock speeds work. The GPU has a minimum or base clock speed, but has the ability to boost up to higher clock speeds if loads are lower. This is done without exceeding the GPU's TDP. Two TI cards were offered with the 600 series, the more entry level GTX 650 Ti, which was released about a month after the GTX 650, and offered a dramatic increase in CUDA cores from the 384 you got with the GK107 on the GTX 650 to 768 CUDA cores with the GTX 650 Ti's GK106 GPU. Memory remained unchanged aside from a 400 MHz increase in the memory speeds on the 650 Ti. Nvidia also offered a GTX 650 Ti boost later on, which had increased GPU and memory speeds, but the same GPU while coming in at a slightly higher price. But most people went for the 650 Ti, considering that it was only $40 more expensive than the GTX 650. Nvidia launched the GTX 660 Ti a month before the GTX 660, and gave the 660 Ti the same GK104 GPU as the GTX 670 and 680, not the GK106 GPU which was in the GTX 660. Even weirder, the 660 Ti had the exact same amount of CUDA cores as the GTX 670, although it only had 24 ROPs compared to the 670's 32, and it had a smaller 192-bit bus. The 660 Ti was $299 US dollars, a full $100 cheaper than the 670. So once again, this made it a great value for money GPU for those only looking to spend $300 on a graphics card. But it still did get great performance, as it was only about 10% slower than the GTX 670, so many value for money consumers decided to go for that. Apparently, I wasn't one of them though. Nvidia then launched the 700 series and stayed with the 28 nanometer Kepler GPU, although many improvements to improve energy efficiency, especially in regards to caching, led them to make much larger GPUs than the previous generation, with the GTX 780 and its GK110 Kepler GPU having 40% more CUDA cores than the GTX 680 with its GK104 Kepler GPU. This time though, Nvidia changed things up. They offered another entry-level TI graphics card in the GTX 750 Ti, which launched slightly before the GTX 750. However, they used the same GM107 GPU with the 750 Ti, packing 640 CUDA cores compared to the 512 CUDA cores of the GTX 750, although the 750 Ti also had 8 more TMUs, but the clock speeds were identical. The 750 Ti also had faster memory, which resulted in a performance increase of about 15% in many titles over the 750. Although by this point, these cards had started to feel the bite from a resurgent AMD who really started to bite into Nvidia's entry-level GPU market share, so I never remember them being that popular compared to the previous generations. Now despite what you may think, there was actually a GTX 760 Ti, however this was only ever offered to OEMs, so we won't talk about it much in this video since it would be slightly pointless as not many people owned one. There was one more TI card that Nvidia offered with the 700 series. That's right, the GTX 780 Ti. This was the first time that Nvidia had used the TI branding on a high-end enthusiast GPU, and the 780 Ti certainly created quite the stir when it was introduced. 
The GTX 780 Ti was launched six months after the GTX 780 and almost a year after the GTX Titan as Nvidia had been holding it in reserve as a counter to the new and legendary AMD R9 290 and 290Xs which I made a whole video about so definitely go check that out. The 780 Ti was essentially a beefed up GK110 GTX Titan GPU with half the memory giving it the same memory as the 780 but with higher memory speeds to give it slightly higher memory bandwidth than its main competition, the R9 290 and 290X. It came with 2880 CUDA cores, which was more than what the Titan had, and this resulted in 10% higher performance than the R9 290X, and around 15% higher performance than the GTX 780 and the R9 290. Although this came at a huge price premium, as it had a launch price of 700 US dollars, which meant that only enthusiasts, such as myself, actually bought one. The GTX 780 Ti was an absolute beast of a GPU at the time, although it did make people think differently about the Ti branding, which some had associated with great value for money graphics cards, and the 780 Ti was certainly not good value for money with its huge price tag, however it did keep the performance crown for Nvidia. Nvidia skipped the 800 series because they wanted to prevent confusion with the mobile line which had gotten ahead of itself, so they just went straight to the 900 series. The 900 series saw Maxwell GPUs replace all of the aging Kepler GPUs throughout the entire lineup, not just the entry level cards, and showed a new focus on power efficiency and the introduction of many new technologies such as dynamic super resolution, HDMI 2.0, MFAA, real-time voxel global illumination, and much more. The 900 series only saw a single TI card, which was once again the flagship GPU, the mighty GTX 980 Ti, with its GM200 Maxwell GPU, featuring 2816 CUDA cores, 176 TMUs, 96 ROPs alongside 6 gigabytes of GDDR5 memory at 7000 MHz on a 384-bit bus, which arrived about 9 months after the GTX 980. The 980 Ti shared almost nothing in common with the 980 and was more or less a cut-down Titan X with a vastly lower price tag at $650 compared to the $999 of the Titan X but had a very similar performance, meaning that when I tested it against the 980 in 2015, the 980 Ti would beat it by about 20 FPS on average, which was a solid result, and I enjoyed running the ASUS Strix 980 Ti in my personal rig. It seemed like people missed the Ti cards because Nvidia brought out three for the 10 series Pascal GPUs, one for the entry level, one for the mid to high level, and another to be the flagship gaming GPU. Pascal saw the introduction of 16 nanometer GPUs with huge improvements to performance per watt, and the introductions of GPU Boost 3.0, GDDR5X memory, DisplayPort 1.4, HDMI 2.0B, simultaneous multi projection, and many more new technologies, while also seeing Nvidia decide to sell directly to consumers for the first time by introducing the Founders Edition cards, which are generally overlooked in favor of good non-reference designs. The GTX 1050 Ti launched alongside the GTX 1050 about 6 months after the GTX 1080 first launched the Pascal series, and featured 768 CUDA cores compared to the 640 on the 1050, it also had 8 more TMUs and twice as much memory at 4GB. Both had the same memory speeds and bus, however the 1050 actually had slightly higher clock speeds. In my own testing, I saw that the 1050 Ti would beat the 1050 by about 10 FPS on average at 1080p, which is a good result, but depending on the pricing in your country, the 1050 could oftentimes come out as better value for money. Again though, this is very much dependent on the pricing in the country that you live in. The GTX 1070 Ti was a GPU that I really didn't think needed to exist, but Nvidia certainly did and brought it out a full 18 months after the GTX 1070 came out. 
although this was still a full year before they planned on releasing their next generation of graphics cards, which shows how long we were on Pascal for. The 1070 Ti shared the same GP104 GPU as the 1070 and 1080, but it got a considerable bump up in CUDA cores to 2432 compared to the 1920 CUDA cores in the 1070, which put it close to the 2560 CUDA cores of the GTX 1080. Adding to this, it got a bump up to 152 TMUs from the 1070s 120, which also put it close to the 1080s 160 TMUs. However, just like the 1070, the 1070 Ti had to make do with 8GB of GDDR5 memory at 7000MHz, compared to the 8GB of GDDR5X memory at 10,000MHz on the 1080, which alongside the clock speed increases on the 1080, meant that the 1070 Ti fit almost perfectly between the GTX 1070 and the GTX 1080, which is exactly what Nvidia wanted, since the AMD Vega 56 also sat between the two. The 1070 Ti was actually quite good value for money, all things considered, and a few people still bought them. But it seemed like a complete afterthought from Nvidia, who just wanted to make sure they saturated the market even further. So I was never that thrilled by the GTX 1070 Ti. The GTX 1080 Ti, on the other hand, was anything but an afterthought, coming out just under a year after the GTX 1080 launched. And loads of people still run and love these graphics cards. It's probably the GPU that I've tested and used the most behind the AMD R9 290. That's how much experience I have had with the GTX 1080 Ti. The 1080 Ti was a trimmed down version of the Titan X Pascal, with the same amount of CUDA cores, but with slightly fewer ROPs, and a lowered memory amount, but only by 1GB. Nvidia also reduced the bus width from 384 to 352, although memory speeds were actually higher on the 1080 Ti by 1000MHz. All of this made the GTX 1080 Ti an absolutely legendary GPU, and it pulled a pretty big performance gap over the GTX 1080, being about 30% faster on average in my own testing, which was incredible as the GTX 1080 isn't slow at all, and it showed how much power the 1080 Ti had, although it did come with a decent price tag too, so it was obviously aimed at the enthusiast crowd. I absolutely loved running my MSI Gaming X GTX 1080 Ti. It never missed a beat. It's a bit early to be making comments about the Turing GPUs, as more Ti cards are most likely going to be added to the lineup, so I might save that for a future video. But this video was more a historical look back at all the previous generation Ti graphics cards that Nvidia has made, and the ones that were special to me. I hope you have enjoyed this video, let me know in the comment section down below which Nvidia Ti graphics card you've owned, and as always, I'll see you guys next time.